Good afternoon and a warm welcome to London Cello Society's online presentation of great cellos both seen and heard. This event is being co-hosted by Cello Bello and Cremonese violin maker Edgar Russ. We are also most grateful to the support of myluthier.co, fine contemporary violin dealers here in London. My name is Justin Pearson, I'm a cellist and I'm delighted to be joined today by the distinguished British solo cellist Raphael Wolfish. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you. Over many decades of both playing and listening to great cellos and their cellists, I've been privileged to experience some of the greatest sounding instruments brought to their full potential. Each one of these cellos you will hear today and their cellists have made an indelible impression on me. I will talk with these cellists, finding out more about their instruments, discussing the provenance of their celebrated cellos, exploring what these instruments feel like to play. A few years ago, London Cello Society presented a memorable concert where all the cellos were made by great Venetian luthiers, featuring instruments by Montagnana, Seraphin and Graffilla. Israeli cellist Ahmed Pellet flew into London, bringing with him Pablo Casals' 1733 Matteo Graffilo cello. Ahmed was jet-lagged when he arrived at my house and went upstairs to have a nap. Meanwhile, he invited me to practice on one of the most special cellos I've ever heard. You can imagine the privilege and humility I felt when I placed my bow on the strings of an instrument that had shaped not only my passion for the cello, but had served as an eloquent voice for Pablo Casals when he expressed his powerful, universal message of justice and peace. Those next couple of hours were among the most memorable of my life. Pablo Casals could have played on any cello of his choice. He was so well known, and I know at one stage he was offered the Piatti Stradivarius to play. Um, why do you think he chose a Graffilla? Well, I think Graffilla in general, with my experience, um, he's the most, the closest to the human voice, has a very throaty, um, real, real sincere uh, human voice, not like a Strad, which is a voice we want to have. <laughs> or a Guarneri, it's a voice we wish we could have this golden sound, golden voice. Gofrilla, I always felt, is like a person talk, a person that maybe has a cold, a person that is maybe a little tired, a person that is happy, a sad. So it's a very real throaty sound, I felt, and especially this Gofrilla uh, that Casals chose and made his life uh, journey with. And so I think, you know, playing on a Guarneri for a long time before that and trying many strads afterwards, it's really a feeling that, okay, that's a sound that I wish I could have if I would sing in the shower. But this gofriller is my sound in the shower. <laughs> and so it's very real. And if it's so real, maybe you can make your own voice sound real to the public. And I think that is Kazal's sound, is a real human voice. One of the things I was really interested in playing the cello is it wasn't easy. I, Not at all. <laughs> the, the nut, uh, just below the scroll, is very high, and so the action was quite difficult. And particularly 
embark, you find it, you, you want quite an easy action, but it, it was it was a difficult. Did you find it difficult to play initially? Extremely difficult. <laughs> it took me, in fact, it took me a few months to even. So the first months was to realize that I even have it in my my possession and I can play on it. And then the, the, the whole period of people wanting to hear Casals, but hearing me and realizing, wait, you have to find your own sound. And then the whole process of, okay, now it, it's a working tool. Can I try to really find my way to play it? And it's not easy. The cello has so many colors and so much personality, but as much as it offers you those colors, it offers you difficulties to find them. Um, I find more than any other old instrument that uh, the fact of finding a way not to disturb it um, was the most evident, has been the most evident with that cello. And uh, it took me a long time of changing my playing, I think, in a good way, because I had to learn how not to press, how not to fight it, because if you fight it, it chokes completely right away. And it took me a long time, and then it went through a huge restoration as well, because I, after a Three months, I think, I called Mrs. Casals and I told her that I think the cello needs some restoration because it was very low, the fingerboard. And I couldn't make a new bridge. I went to the guy in New York and he tried to fit the bridge and he said, I can't, it's too low. So instead of just pushing it up like we do with some instruments, just to giving it a little bit of a kick, this one had to be gone inside. And Mrs. Casals, to her benefit, I have to say, she said, thank you so much for being honest with me. Nobody has been honest with me with the cello. <laughs> Everybody says, oh my God, what a cello, Casals, and, and then they hand it back to, me, back to me. You have to live with it, so you've been honest. And she appreciated it, even though I was scared to death to tell her that, because <laughs> she's kind of a scary lady as much as I admire her. But we went together to New York and she said, go share the legacy of Casals, but also go and find your own voice with it. And I didn't understand it first, and it took me all that time of the restoration and the time with it and the changing, especially the bow arm, I, I must say, um, of how to produce sound without disturbing, because with that particular cello, it just doesn't work. But once you do that, it's so amazing, it's so human, it's so beautiful, it's so deep, and it's so personal. It really allows you to find your own voice. Um, hard to describe in words. Yes. Something rather amusing. You, you tell me that when you opened the case, you could smell Casals's pipe smoke. And Definitely. there's also, I think, on the side of the cello, you can explain there's a, a, the, some wear. Yeah, so exactly. So when I opened it, when I opened the case uh, in, in Mrs. Casals' apartment in New York, and um, that was after many years that it hasn't been played. It was played, I think, in 2001 by Claudio Borges for a year. Um, and then it was in the case. So basically from that moment, 2001 was a little stop on the, on the journey of sleeping, I call it, uh, since he passed away. People would take it out for a concert, for an event, but it hasn't been really played. And we know that Kazakh, we have even famous photo of him recording the Dvozhak with a pipe in the 30s in Barcelona. And so we know that he used to smoke he even um, casually would put the, the mattress <laughs> inside the cello, don't tell anybody. But uh, so when it came out of the case, of course, I was um, intoxicated by the story and the history, but I could smell definitely the, the pipe. And then when I got it and started playing on it, because I play on a very long end pin, I'm 6'5", I'm very tall, um, I had at some point realized that if I put the cello on the side and I don't squeeze it or, or hug it like we normally do with a cello, it opens up even more. So I started playing on the side and then I realized that that's exactly, looking at photos, that's exactly where Casals had the cello. He had the cello, he had his knee behind the cello, but of much lower than what I had. And once you spot that location, you see the sweat. You see the sweat from his knee and that is like when we have the chest and we have a little bit of a bright area where the chest touched the cello, he had that area for the knee. And I realized that with that cello, if you do it, if you put sit in, sit in that way, it just give you a much better sound. And I wish I could talk to him about it. Maybe he went through the same process.
these talks that we're having with celebrated cellists, it becomes apparent that not one of the cellists owns their own cello. Uh, as a teacher, do you think that your students require uh, an important old cello to perform on to have a big career? Or is it possible to have a career with a, a contemporary instrument nowadays? I, I strongly believe in contemporary instruments and bows. Um, I think they're, they're terrific. And some of the young makers are making amazing instruments. And I myself own two. <laughs> um, I think it's important for us educators to promote them. It's a little bit like modern music. I mean, is it important for us to have more new music for cello? Well, we have enough. We thankfully had Rostropovich giving us a big push, but, and same with instruments. I mean, we cannot afford them. They cannot afford them. Uh, I think it's wrongly the perception that I can only have my Wigmo Hall debut if I have a Stradivarius in my hand. No, you can play on a modern instrument. You can work hard, make a career. Yes, true. Eventually, when you look at the top-notch artists in our world, most of them are playing on, on old instruments. That's true. But I can say from my own experience that I, when I started my career and had my um, Wigmore Hall debut and a Wild Recital Hall debut and got accepted to Marlboro Festival, I made my audition on a $3,000 cello, all German unnamed cello, uh, which if I listen now to those recordings, I love it. And, and I had to work hard to learn how to make sound, to learn how to, to do everything. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think we should promote it for students that you have to kind of earn it before you, you get to play. And I have to say that my experience with the Casals cello would not be fruitful and positive if I wouldn't go through playing on an old German cello for many years this $3,000 instrument, then jumping to a Thomas Dodd cello, then moving to an old Italian Milanese cello without name that was on loan for me, then jumping to the Andreas Guarneri 1689 that was big jump, you know, to all of a sudden have your Pavarotti in your hand, and then going to Casal's cello, Gofrilo. So I think all of this experience would not, I wouldn't appreciate the Casal's cello. I wouldn't know what to do because Sometimes this feeling of letting go and allowing the cello to tell you what to do, I wouldn't be able, I would get frustrated. I would try to make it and it wouldn't let me and I would push it away like I think some of my colleagues did before with this cello. And I, uh, that, that experience, that kind of maybe I will say knowledge of, okay, now let go. Why did Pablo Casals love this cello? Let's, let's let go and find out. And once you do that, I needed to go through those instruments in order to appreciate it, I'm sure, for myself. Well, the two great things that all the guests on this programme share in common is that they're all incredibly relaxed, or they look incredibly relaxed when they play their instruments. They never crush the sound, they never force, they never push. And the other thing that they share in common is that they're all very, very reflective and thoughtful thinkers and are able to explain in the most magical way what their relationship uh, they have with their instruments. And you've done that today, Amit. It's been a huge oh, privi you. privilege to see you again. Good luck with all your projects and uh, look forward to seeing you in London again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Justin. That has been a pleasure. Well, we very much enjoyed the nimble-fingered Amit Pellet athletically performing Fauré's Papillon. You have a little story about Papillon, I believe, Raphael. Well, I was just thinking, um, I had the amazing privilege to, to study with Gregor Piatigorsky in the 70s. And uh, I remember him talking about the various bugs that he used to learn and used to play, or, you know, including butterflies and caterpillars and <laughs> bumblebees and so on. And he said, um, of course, you can play this piece even with a muton. And then he said, I, I did that once in the, in the Albert Hall and it seemed to work very well which is a, w a wonderful thought because a piece like that, it just, just floats and uh, I can imagine him doing that. In his hands. Uh, the interviews you are watching today have been edited. If you wish to see the complete extended interviews, they will be av available in a few days time on my Luthier YouTube channel. 
At the end of this presentation, Raphael Wolfosch will be taking questions. Uh, viewers can write questions in the comments section and we'll monitor these during the programme. One of the great things about instruments made by Antonio Stradivarius is that their provenance, the owners and their great players who have performed on them, can in many cases be traced back to when they were made. The models used by Stradivari for his cellos varied considerably over the long span of his career. The earliest examples were large and unwieldy by modern playing standards. The former B cellos from his middle period are of dimensions most favoured by cellists today. The later period cellos are, for the most part, shorter and narrower. There are approximately 20 surviving instruments of the former B pattern, which include some of the most famous cellos in history. The Rostropovich Dupour, the Davidoff, played by Jacqueline Dupre and currently Yo-Yo Ma, the Piatigorsky Batter and the Piatti Strad. The Marquis de Corberon is the last cello that Stradivari made on this model in 1726, when Stradivari was over the age of 80. It is first recorded as belonging to the Marquis de Corberon, a diplomat at the French court in the 18th century. This unfortunate nobleman and his family were guillotined in the revolution in 1789. I was very honoured to play this cello very briefly when it was returned to the Royal Academy of Music after an extended loan to Zara Nilsova. Stephen Islis is currently the cellist loaned this famous instrument. I'm very pleased indeed to welcome Stephen Islis um, to this event. He is the Marquis de Corberon visiting professor of cello at the Royal Academy of Music, artistic director or advisor, sorry, to London Cello Society, but more importantly, he is regarded quite rightly as one of the greatest cellists alive in the world today. Stephen, very warm welcome. Uh, Thank you. You play the Marquis de Corberon Stradivarius cello, which made in 1726. Um, perhaps you might just tell us a little bit about its provenance, how it came into your hands, and um, what it's like to, to be playing that cello currently. Well, I'd better start with an admission that you just told me about the provenance, about the previous owners, which I didn't know about. I'm amazed you tell me that Grutzmacher, the dreaded Grutzmacher, played it. Who actually used to play whole Bach suites in concerts in the 19th century? It's not true that Casals was the first to do it. But how he played them, I cannot imagine from his edition. He um, transposed the D major suite to G, for instance, so it would be easier. And I think he's a very doubtful figure. And I hate what he did to the Boccherini B flat concerto. On the other hand, he's the one who saved the concerto because he also copied out the real original version. And that's the only copy we have. Um, from you know, we don't have anything in Boccherini's hand. So anyway, you just told me that he played it. Uh, that and was then Hugo, Hugo Becker played it, and Grismacher and Piatti were his teachers. That was the association with Grismacher. Ah, well, Hugo Becker was also a slightly suspicious character. I think there's a very funny story about him in the Piedigorsky. <laughs> Piedigorsky's autobiography, which is a wonderful book, and how Becker sort of played the Dvorak opening to him and said, now, how did that sound? You know, you're an artist, I'm an artist, you tell me. And Piedigorsky said it just sounded like nothing on earth. He didn't know what to say. And um, I wonder if it was the Marcus that he was playing at the time. And he was Casals' nemesis, apparently. So, And he's, his edition of the Bach Suites is also a disaster. Um, that's one I and many cellists started on. I mean, you know, it's compl it a completely different era. One can't judge, but I do think I did find not so long ago, I walked in in New York on a teacher teaching the bus switch and she was using that edition. I was appalled. Um, anyway, but that's a bit negative. I don't mean to be negative. And you just told me, which I didn't know, that the Marquis de Corberon was guillotined. So I hope that doesn't happen to sort of every male person who plays the cello. <laughs> um, and, but the one I knew it when I first heard it, but also I used to see it, was Zara Nelsova, who, of whom I was very fond, what a wonderful, warm character she was. And in fact, I visited her twice during her last illness. And one time she was lying in bed, in fact, and the cello was on the bed next to her. 
And of course, I didn't know at that point that I would end up playing it, but so it does have quite a resonance for me um, in every way. Of course, she made this huge, warm sound on, on the cello. So it was great. But then afterwards, well, I was friends with, I was very involved, I still am actually, with the Royal Academy of Music. And I was friends with Curtis Price, who was a principal, and he kept telling me that one, one day I'd, I'd be welcome to play the cello. I didn't quite believe him. And at the time, I was playing on another wonderful Strad anyway, the Feuermann Strad, or the De Monk Strad, which was lent to me by the Nippon Music Foundation in Japan. So I really didn't need another Strad. There's only like 50 in the world. One cello shouldn't have two of them. That's too big a percentage. Um, so, but then eventually, I was offered the Marcus, and gorgeous though the Feuermann cello is, I have to say I preferred the Marquis, so I gave back the the Foreman. It was rather sad, my last concert on it in Tokyo. I finished with the Swan. That was it. Uh, they took the cello away. Um, but I was very happy to play on this. I mean, it's my dream cello at the Marquis. And it was very interesting once I tried the two side by side, the Foreman and the Marquis. It was almost funny they were so different. I mean, it's me playing, so in a way, you know, if the same cellist plays, there shouldn't be that much difference, but they have completely different souls. And whereas the the Feuermann or the De Monk Stradivarius is almost like a violin, it's got a sort of very trebly sound, and very clear, very precise. And where the Marcus is much more bassy and it's just an all enveloping sound and the warmth of it, I just love and the poetry. I think that the tonal qualities of the Marquis de Corbron might relate to the fact that it's got a, a willow back uh, rather than a maple back. Uh, when you look at cellos well, like the, the Markovich, which the, the Strad owns, they're, they're such magnificent looking cellos, but you have this, this soft wood in the back, the willow and a beech head and Stradivarius being 80 when he made it. Everything was feels looser and it, it feels like it's um, much warmer in, in conception. Uh, I agree it's warm. Whether it's because it's willow, I do not know. I mean, I didn't actually know it was made from willow until you told me today. Um, I thought it was made from poplar because I remember telling some children that I had my children series for a bit in New York. And I remember telling them it was poplar and that was why I was such a poplar guy um, or some other feeble joke. <laughs> Um, so I don't know. I know nothing about instruments. I mean, I would not recognize the Stradivarius if you showed me one. I wouldn't recognize a bow by Tuart, whatever. I just know whether I like the sound and the feel. And I love the sound and feel. Yes, it's an incredibly warm sound. I know one thing which is the bane of a lot of cellists uh, is wolf, well, wolf notes. Uh, when you're yes. metaphorically on a horse and it refuses to jump, we find them in third position particularly 
or fourth position on, on the G-string. Does the Marquis de Corbon have any wolf notes on it? What a train spotting question. Um, yes, yes, it definitely has the F. Um, I mean, occasionally it changes. It's funny, day to day. When we're recording the Mendelssohn trios, actually, Los Angeles, some time ago, that opening melody with its, with its F on the third bar, I eventually I had to just put the mute, I put the mute right up the other side of the bridge. And that stopped the, the wolf just growling at me. Does that affect your fingerings occasionally then? Do you, do you have to actually finger on the... No, you don't just play into the string. It's a wolf. Who cares? It's a wolf. You don't want it on, you don't want it on a recording, but so what? Well, wolves are valuable creatures. We're all signing petitions to save them. I'm not going to <laughs> kill them with different fingerings. You have to vibrate a bit more, maybe, to cover the sound a bit. That's all. But that is not the end of the world. It's a wolf. It's a, it's a characteristic sound, characterful. One of the things I would say is the greatest characteristic of your, your playing is that you sustain beautiful, long legato lines. And this, your playing is so eloquent, like we hear in the, in the Schumann Concerto. Um, one of the things I feel about great cellos, uh, particularly the the Italian, the great Italian instruments, is that they can sustain a phrase when you leave one note, it will connect up with the bloom of the sound across the shift and sustain in, in a way that other cellos can't. Do you, is that one of the attractions of the marquee? I suppose, I never really thought about it. I think that's more of a question of the bow, isn't it? Than the cello. I mean, yes, it's got a, it produces enough vibrations that it will continue, you know, I suppose through the notes, but it's more up to the cellist, I would say, and the bow is very important for that. And how one uses the bow. It's legato. I mean, legato, I sometimes describe as being like water that's calm on the surface, which is a lot going on underneath to make that legato live. It's a true legato. It's not just an even sound. Well, I think that's absolutely brilliant, Stephen. I think we've got um, some really, really okay. lovely, lovely comments there. And, and what I like most of all, oh, just you saying that when you play the Corberon, it's just your natural voice. It feels like the voice you want, the sound you want to make and the sound that's in your head. Mm. That's exactly, for me, that's the, the cello you found, the cello, if you found the cello, it does that, then you then you really, truly have yeah, exactly. a I've right seen nice place. Maybe two or three other strads that I imagine, I know both of them have similar qualities. There's the Mara and the Edmund Kurtz's cello, I thought was amazing. I can't even remember where I knew him slightly, but I can't remember when I heard it. I thought that's an amazing cello. But I'm really, you know, I mean, the Academy say, you know, it's only a limited number of years. They've lent it to me for only, you know, five years at a time or something. But I say it's a loan for life. And they say, no, it's not. It's for years. I say, yes, it is a loan for life because if you ever take it away from me, I shall kill myself. <laughs> Therefore, a loan for life. You learned that from Zara Nelson. Uh... Uh, I see. No, I didn't. I could. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yeah. That's really fantastic. Um, Pleasure. Great. And good um, luck with um, everything you do. Thanks. Stephen Islis uh, beautifully performed some of the adagio from Joseph Haydn's Concerto in C Major with the Norwegian Chamber Orchestra, directed by Anthony Marwood. At a recent London Cello Society concert entitled Two Cellos, we featured cellists in duet. Just a few days before the concert, I was invited by the excellent cellist and dealer Matthew Huber to visit him in Wigmore Street to try an exceptional Andrea Guarneri cello. Made in Cremona as early as 1669, the cello had been played by David Sawyer of the Guarneri String Quartet. I was immediately struck by the wide, even grain on the belly, the incredibly characterful figuration of the back, and its rich ruby varnish. It sounded just as wonderful as it looked. When Peter Whispleway tried out this guarneri, he played a long chromatic scale from the bottom to the top and said, There's not one note that sounds less or more. It is completely even over the whole range of the cello. That's what you feel immediately when you pick it up. It's like a piano. Each sound has the same quality, nothing protrudes. 
This cello is now played by the superb Swiss cellist Thomas Domingo. <laughs> I'm delighted now to be joined by Thomas Domenga, who is one of the most capable, brilliant musicians that I know in so many different areas. He is a wonderful international cellist. He's also a composer and a, a teacher of note. A warm welcome, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us. The last time I saw you in London, you were performing on a 1595 Brothers Amati cello, and now, in the last few years, you're playing on an Andrea Guarneri 1669 cello, which used to belong to David Sawyer, the cellist of the Guarneri String Quartet. Now, I've changed cellos a few times in my career, and it's taken me about a year to become accustomed to the new cello, and I wonder how you found that voyage of discovery on the new cello. Yes, you're absolutely right. It, it does take a long time until you really know the cello and it's what it is capable to do and, uh, under under somebody's hands. So uh, what happened to me was when I picked up that very cello, the Guarneri, it was uh, right before a concert at Whitmore Hall, actually, and I was playing my Amati, as you said, which was also a fantastic cello. Um, I was playing all the suites in a series in Whitmore combined with modern music. And I tried it and I immediately fell in love, as we say. I mean, it, it took me two minutes to realize that this is really a great instrument. And, uh, well, we have the feeling sometimes an instrument is great in any case, only by the loops also. 
Um, but what happens when you play a cello and it just opens your ears and you just hear the, the sound and the possibilities? Uh, this is what we call uh, the you know, love at first sight. You, know, you don't need to play more than one or two minutes and you know this is great. So, but then afterwards, of course, you start to notice that there are also problems with the cello, as we all know. It's like with a human being, I would say. I mean, you can fall in love with somebody and for a couple of weeks or months, everything is 100% fantastic. And then you start to get to know each other and you, you know, <laughs> things happen and uh, we start to notice the problems and how to deal with them. It's exactly the same thing with an instrument. You, you said in an interview, you said, seldom have I picked up a cello and not had anything to complain about. I was happy straight away. And I have to say that was exactly how I felt about that Guarneri cello. When I played on it, it was exactly how I want to sound. So I'm very, very envious of your having the cello, but delighted that it's, it's in such brilliant, brilliant hands. You uh, play contemporary music and also uh, period music. You, your bark is quite exceptional. Do you uh, set up the instrument differently for different performances or not? Um, all I did actually was put, uh, I put gut strings on it. And well, what was different too, I tuned it to, to my tuning of Bach, uh, for full note down, uh, following uh, Amr Beltma's first recording, which was very low also. Yeah, the cello feels relaxed. I mean, I think nowadays the problem is that we always, we put too much pressure on the chest of a cello. And uh, it has, of course, advantages, but at the same time, uh, it can be dangerous to put too much pressure on it and the cello doesn't feel free anymore. So, um, that was a really beautiful experience playing the gut strings and the baroque bow. I have a baroque bow, but other, otherwise the cello is of course the same. It's just that the strings are different. You had heard David Sawyer playing when you were young and he was quite an influence on your career as well. Is that correct? Well, then this is a really funny story because, uh, and, and a very touching story for me personally, because uh, I was maybe 16. So that's now to tell you the truth, exactly 50 years ago, so half a century, <laughs> when the word came to Bern, my home city, and they played in the chamber music series in the conservatory in Bern. And of course I went to this concert and I just couldn't believe um, the sound of this you know, David Sawyer, this, this huge man, and he would just pull the bow and it went woof. And, you know, it was just unbelievably beautiful. So many, many years later, this cello and it's put into my hands and I could, I could play it. I almost had to cry, you know, I mean, it was really incredible. At this point, of course, I had no idea that I would ever touch that cello. And uh, I really have a, a lot of good feelings towards him and his instrument, of course. I'm so grateful to have it. One thing I was really fascinated by is when I take my cello out, I'm fortunate enough to have a Francesco Ruggieri. Uh, there's a word that T.S. Eliot uses when he is uh, in, the, in his poem, The Journey of the Magi. He, he describes waking up the camels in the morning. He calls them incalcitrant. And it's funny how these instruments, you can take them out of the case in the morning and it's like having to uh, wake up a dog <laughs> they can be very sleepy and, and resist you for up to 20 minutes and then the relationship starts and they start singing. Uh, I, w I was interested that you said that about the Guarneri. Yes, I, I, I feel that uh, it, it's, it's very strange uh, what, what, that you're saying that. I feel sometimes the first time I come down into my studio, I pick up the cello and I think, Ah, uh, it doesn't sound so free today or so good. I play 10 minutes and there I am, you know, 
I'm there, the cello is, and there I am, you know, together. It's, it's amazing. And I think, well, now what happened in this couple of minutes? Uh, it sounds so much better after a couple of notes of playing. And I really wonder, is that, is there something in the wood, in the cello, that it starts vibrating, or is it just us? You know? Is it just, again, our ear, our... We are, if we make a problem, we think, we think it doesn't sound, then we believe it in the end. And uh, if you relax and play, then it sounds good again. You know? It's an amazing, it's a very, very interesting thing. Well, Thomas, that's been really, really wonderful hearing your reminiscences and your thoughts on your wonderful Andrea Guarneri cello. We wish you very well with all your projects in the coming year. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. The fine antique in Italian instruments featured today were mostly made in an incredibly fertile couple of decades between 1714 and 1733. And it's tempting to think that this was a golden age of instrument making and instrument making could never be bettered. But today's luthiers are hugely knowledgeable, skillful and dedicated. I did not wish today's event simply to re re revere cellos from the past without expressing that, in my opinion, we are living in another great period of instrument making. I thought it would be fascinating to engage with a contemporary instrument maker so as to better appreciate that superb instruments are being made today which already sound excellent. I spoke with luthiers Mina Mazzolari and Edgar Ross, who make instruments in Cremona. Re Rebecca Gilliver, principal cellist of the London Symphony Orchestra, most generously agreed to perform Fauré's Elegy on Mina's new cello. Rebecca cannot be with us today. She's performing with the LSO, so she's written a few words which I'll read. I was given the cello just half an hour before my London Symphony Orchestra rehearsal. In a reckless moment, I decided to play it for the rehearsal, which just happened to feature one of the biggest orchestral cello solos in the repertoire, Strauss's Bourgeois Gentillon, with Sir Simon Rattle conducting. I just sat back and listened to my sound and let the cello talk to me. It was remarkable, easy to play in comparison with my rather temperamental, albeit gorgeous, Ruggieri. Many colleagues in the orchestra didn't realise I'd changed instrument even though they'd heard me play solos on the Italian instrument for over 10 years. I then had no time to play the cello again until the foray recording at your house yesterday. Playing it in the living room with piano, as opposed to a socially distanced chamber orchestra in a hall, was much harder. Both the cello and I learnt a lot during the morning. I had a tendency to press a little, as my Ruggieri requires a lot of work. This new cello will undoubtedly develop into a great instrument, but it's got 325 years of catching up to do. So now let's join Edgar and Mina in Cremona. So do you spe specialise in making cellos, uh, Mina? No, we no. make violin, viola, cello, double basses also. She's right now working on a cello. Another Montagnana. A Montagnana. Yep. I'm going to fix it. You okay. <laughs> Otherwise they don't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, we are in three in our workshop and yeah. each of us are making a cello. Edgar is making Ruggeri, I'm making another Montagnana, and Marco is almost finished with his Stradivari Corbus. Right. And it will be very interesting at the end how the how differences of this uh, difference, you know. So whose cello is this being brought through here? That looks like a Montagnana to me. This is Montagnana, yeah. Yeah. Now, is there any is there any particular Montagnana that you copy? The Sleeping Beauty. Yes, no. Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> This is very interesting to me because uh, you're copying uh, Venetian instruments when you're in Cremona. And I was wondering what the weight of tradition is on Cremonese makers to make Cremonese models. In the violin making school, you actually always had to make the Stradivari Piatti, mm -hmm. which is a very famous cello, or maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it was uh, more famous. In the past years, then, Different models actually won always the sounds, tests, and a Ruggeri or a Montagnana are definitely 
more a sound which is nowadays more research than a Stradivari. And I think the main reason for that is that the Stradivari cellos, the, the body is actually too long and they're rather narrow. And nowadays, it's, uh, we know that if the body is a little bit shorter, like the Montagnana, the original size, which is like a 74.4 centimeters, that's definitely better for the deeper registers. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the Italian tone. Uh, people here are very insistent that there is a specific Italian voice would you say that is true? Yes, definitely. Yeah. The secret is actually in simplicity. One thing is certainly the arching, which is in Italy different than the rest of the world. And then over the years, then outside, people have adapted a little bit this kind of arching and things like this. But just think of a German instrument of those years was super high arching. The arching was so high and structured in a way that it was only for uh, keeping the, the, the forces uh, well up. And so it, it, it turned out to be beautiful, but not strong enough. While the Italians made it a little bit different shaped in a way that it is more made for vibrating and not so much for stiffness and uh, this constructional uh, point of view. And another the uh, uh, detail is that Italians made a, a top rather regular thickness. And this is one of the key points. While on the back, you have a very high center of the back. And then it becomes thin towards the edge or to the upper and the lower area of the, of the, of the plates. On a cello, this whole concept is a little bit different because we make here along the base bar a larger stripe like three centimeters where it is slightly higher than the rest of the top and to avoid too much wolf tone we make here underneath the f holes inside a little bit thicker so you have like a a, a bump here you can feel it that's interesting we talked to steve nestless about the the wolf notes on the Marquis de Corberon. Uh, are you conscious of trying to get rid of wolf notes in the making process or trying to minimize them? We try to minimize because actually every good sounding instrument has a wolf. Living with that wolf exactly on that tone can be a little bit a uh, pain. So you have to you move it a little bit at least yeah, in order that it's at least between two notes. Yeah? Absolutely, yes. Where do you think your instruments might be in 300 years? And looking back, do you think your lives are substantially different from the lives of the luthiers who worked in Cremona 300 years ago? 300 years from now, this is a long time. I, actually, that's a question I've never thought about. Mm -hmm. eh? no. But certainly in, in, in some ways, uh, when, when I, be, I came to Cremona, it was always spready, very spready, very, and you know, it's, it's like a god and sometimes you even doubt that he existed. And then the more you live and years go by, you realize how short actually your life is. And the more you go on, the quicker time passes by. The workshop we're working here is 1500 something. So at the time of Spreadyberry was close to 200 years already. When it comes to making an instrument, it's actually the same. You have to make it the same way how they made it 300 years ago. Mm. It's a nice feeling to make instruments and you know when you, when it's your turn to say goodbye, these things will still be here and somebody is making his living or is enjoying to play it, yeah? It's played. Congratulations on your making. Thank you. And it's going to be a huge <laughs> pleasure to hear Rebecca Gilbert playing the Foray Elegy on your cello. Thank you so much, yeah. both of you. Thank you.
Rebecca Gillibur and Sophia Raman in a deeply touching performance of Fauré's Elegy, music so poignantly apt for the challenging times we're living through. Guy Johnson is a great friend to London Cello Society. He was catapulted to fame at an early age, but the search for a cello that matched his prodigious talent was drawn out and not always easy. A number of years ago, a group of supporters, including the Royal Society of Musicians, were able to purchase a superb David Tackler cello, which was made in Rome in 1714. Guy joined me from his new home in Eastman, Rochester, near New York, to talk about his cello journey. Delighted now to welcome Guy Johnson, who is Associate Professor of Cello at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. Hello, Guy. How is it over in New York? Greetings from across the pond. Now, you have been on a spectacular cello journey in that the first time I met you, you didn't even own a cello at all, uh, which was extraordinary given that you had been cat catapulted into an enormous fame at an early age. Perhaps you might like to describe us a little about that journey because I think it might resonate with other young musicians. Actually, it's, uh, it just suddenly flashed back to me the moment when I saw you at the Ciccone Festival and we were chatting after or in the interval at the end of the concert. Um, and I was sort of lamenting the fact that I didn't own an instrument or I was searching. That was quite a few years ago now. And then you, you offered me the, this wonderful opportunity to play on your Ruggieri cello, which was, which was such a godsend at the time. Um, but, but actually, and thank you again for that. Um, what an experience to be able to play on, on such a beautiful instrument. And I learned so much from it. Um, I, funnily enough, when I was a student here at Eastman 20 years ago, um, it all began because I, I was traveling back on my last journey home and I arrived at London Heathrow. And in those days, I was, I had a flight case for the cello and, uh, it was coming out on the conveyor belt. Sometimes they bring it out in the regular door. Um, but as soon as I saw it upside down on the conveyor belt, and I'd heard a bit of a bang before that moment, I thought, this is not good. And I opened the case up, and the front of the cello just fell out onto the floor, um, which was horrifying. And I didn't know what to do, because apart from pick up as much wood as I could find, they put it all back into the case. It was a, It was devastating. And it was very alarming, because I was also thinking practically. I had concerts that were just about to happen. Um, and what on earth, was, what on earth did I do? And um, actually, I called Stephen and I said, you know that, that spare Montagnana of yours? Is, it, is there any chance I could play on it for a bit because I don't have an instrument? And amazingly, he said, yes. And so that was my first sort of dip into, you know, trying, playing these great instruments. And, and I had it for that summer whilst mine was being restored. Um, and then I think it was quite soon after that that I moved on to your Ruggieri cello, um, which I did my first recording with Catherine Stock. We did a, um, a Milo CD uh, with Britain and Bridge and Mark Anthony Turnage. And I had, I think I was playing that for a couple of years. But then in, at the same time, I was sort of searching and looking and, and having a terrible time trying to marry an instrument that I really fell in love with and the finances all at the same time because obviously if you're going through dealers then there's a kind of pressure because there are other people looking at the instruments and um, they there's a certain way in which there's a certain uh, urgency to finding the money and if you really love the instrument um, so it was a bit of a game and I was moving I went, remember going to Paris I remember going to Germany um, I remember you know whenever instruments came up in London and being in touch with sponsors and I tried the Nigel Brown scheme, um, and uh, there were so many moments when I thought, this is it, you know, we're there. And probably over a seven-year period, um, I was basically playing on different instruments every other month. Well, it was all new to me, and I, I, I wasn't completely sure what I was doing. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was a hell of a journey, um, yeah. But the journey ended with a David Tekler cello, from 1714, from Rome. Yeah, exactly. And that, that came through word of mouth, through a player in Amsterdam. You know, my teacher at the time, Stephen Dome, um, well, now my colleague and friend up the corridor from me here at Eastman, um, 
he plays on a beautiful tecla cello. And I, when I heard that there was a tecla cello in Amsterdam, should definitely, you know, go and try it. I thought I jumped at the opportunity. It was, a, it was a huge learning curve. I mean, finding your voice on these instruments and, and the different characteristics of the instruments. And, you know, in the end, you, you just want to settle down with something. It becomes a bit of a minefield because you fall in love with different instruments for different reasons. And then eventually you've just got to settle down. And this, this felt like it, you know, it was the right time. I think it was 2011, 2012. So I've had it for probably a decade now. Um, but it, it, yeah, I was very fortunate that it, it came into my hands. It's sort of the cello found me in this instance. <laughs> One of the things we found from all the players is that none of them own their own instruments at all uh, today, um, which seems extraordinary because when I first came into the profession, a lot of the senior players owned wonderful instruments, but obviously that's beyond the means of even the top international stellars now. So how did you go about uh, acquiring the instrument? Yeah, so then um, really close friends um, were in a, in a situation where they wanted to invest um, you know, certain amount of money. Then the Royal Society of, Mus of Musicians um, came into the picture. And um, I think Nigel Brown, the, the scheme, basically we used as a sort of template and then it transferred over because the R RSM said, well, look, we would be willing to put in the remaining balance and we'll oversee the operation and the, the care of the instrument with Guy and, um, and we'll all be co-owners and let's make it happen suddenly um, the money came together, we'd had all the, the right uh, um, certificates and everything was put in place and it, it just finally worked out, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And we have a kind of 30 year uh, sort of contract with, with every five years, it gets, you know, there's a chance for sponsor, sponsors to, to sell their shares. But, it, but so far, touch wood, I've been very lucky. In 2014, you did have a very special thing. You brought the Tecla cello back to Rome to where it was made, but not just to Rome, to the exact spot where it was made. Perhaps you might tell us a little about that wonderful trip you made with about 50 supporters, I think. It was amazing. It, it, it really took off. I suddenly realised that the, the kind of tricentenary was coming up and I had just had this idea that we should go back to Rome and you know make this recording and um, take some friends and and obviously we needed to raise funds for the recording to record with the Santa Cecilia Orchestra in Rome. And and then I decided that maybe it would be fun to tell the story of the instrument in its current day. So what what have I done with it? Where do I go? And so we traveled from King's College, Cambridge, where I was a chorister, um, and I performed a piece with them. And then we went to the Royal Academy of Music, where I was teaching at the time. And I, I recorded with Sheku, uh, a, a duo, Sonata, Barrier. Um, and then we went to the Wigmore Hall and I, I premiered three new pieces that were written for the cello as a kind of gift for the cello by Mark Simpson, Charlotte Bray and David Matthews. And then I think I've got the right order. And then we, we ended up in Rome. And it was like, it was just amazing that the, the street, Via de Leotari, um, it's still there. Um, the, the string houses aren't there anymore the street of the Luthiers is what it means and um, actually before I got there my landlady at the time and friend Miranda fully loved was in Rome with her son and he was having some Italian lessons and I, I just said to her, look can you go and have a look at this address on the street and so she said of course and then she had this extraordinary <laughs> experience where she saw a builder on the street and she was knocking on the door and no one was answering and the, street, the, the, the builder was like can I help you and this was all in this lovely Italian and She's like, yeah, I'm just wondering if, you know, do you know the owner who, you know, who lives in? He's like, no, um, you know, sorry, I can't help you. And she was like, well, okay, well, is there any good coffee around here? And she said, oh, there's a, there's a great place up the road. So she went up the road for coffee and within 10 minutes, the builder came in almost with a guy around the scruff of his neck saying, I've, I've met the guy. He's in Rome for one day and he's just visiting his apart set of apartments because, you know, he was coming to see that everything was in order. And so that's how this whole thing kind of kicked off because he was so thrilled. He went back to this special book that has all the names of, of people that had lived there and worked there. And there was Tecla spelt with a K, I think. Mm. And, um, and, it, and, and he was just so thrilled that his, what is now a garage with his motorbike and various bits of scraps of things 
uh, was actually this, this great maker's um, studio at one point. And, and so then he, he said, come, bring your friends, have a concert here, stay in the apartment above and we can make it happen. And, and, and it, was, it was just very, very special. So all because of this chat, it wouldn't have happened. This is a train spotting question. Uh, gut strings or metal strings? <laughs> well, I've, I've paid on both on this cello and I went through a real gut phase because all my teachers from the past, you know, played on gut strings and Jane Cowan, their teacher. And so, and there's a certain sound world with that. And I think some of the Schumann clip that you'll play on, I'm, I'm playing on gut strings. That was wonderful for a time and I learned a, an, an amazing amount on them. Um, but in the end, I think the metal strings, just when you're traveling and with all the change in, you know, um, weather and climate and all this stuff, and uh, it just somehow is, is less temperamental. Um, and, uh, and also here in America, it's all about the big sound. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there any particular repertoire which suits your cello? Gosh. I'm playing, I'm playing lots of Bach at the moment. I'm about to play all the Bach suites over the summer and we'll hear the Schumann on it. I, there's a certain repertoire that I love, which maybe it's a combination of the cello and me. Chopin Sonata, we, we love playing together. Um, that was last summer in the Wigmore and, uh, Mendelssohn Sonata, the Beethoven's, the, you know, yeah, the contemporary, I think. I think it's more, what can I cope with? That's the thing about these instruments is that I went through this period of like, why can't it do what, you know, what I want, what I want. And of course, you've got to figure out what the hell you're doing. You can't just expect the instrument to do it for you. <laughs> the yeah. classic high fit, you know, when he put the violin up to his ear and said, oh, I can't hear any sound and someone praised him for that. I, I, I got into awful, like, I basically was in denial about my own playing. I, 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 and through the teaching, I'm beginning to understand that, you know, it's not going to, the great playing isn't going to happen automatically or by chance. And, you know, talent isn't enough. You've got to work and you've got to work hard and you've got to figure things out. And so rather than blaming your tools, you know, I've got to that, that place now where, you know, let's work with this. This is where I'm at with this instrument and it's up to me, you know, and, yeah, there are things, maybe an instrument that I wish it had more of, but then I, I keep coming back to this, well, we've got to work with this. This is the relationship, you know, we've, and, and there are certain days when it feels really great and maybe I'm feeling good and there are days when it's a challenge. Um, but I, I've stopped blaming my tools. That's been really fascinating hearing your thoughts on the cello. Uh, we know that your 40th birthday was only a few days ago. Congratulations. And also congratulations on the forthcoming birth 
of your first baby. We wish you Thank the you. best of luck with all your projects. It's been a huge pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Yeah. In that video clip, Guy Johnson was playing the finale of the Schumann Cello Concerto with the Faust Chamber Orchestra, conducted by Mark Austin. Now I'm delighted to be joined by the great British solo cellist Raphael Wolfish. We both shared the same teacher, Derek Simpson. And being a little younger than Raphael, I remember as a student sitting, listening to him effortlessly rattling off the most difficult passages of the entire cello repertoire. And I've been a bit in awe of him ever since. But uh, Raphael is now playing a, a Domenico Montignano cello made in Venice in 1733. And this cello has incredible provenance, some of it British, which he'll tell us about later, but it was played by Romberg, who uh, I suppose gave us an enormous legacy for, for us cellists. Yes, for us to suffer with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the cello is right here, so I, why don't I bring it in front so you can see it. Um, so it's, as you can see, it's a very dark cello. Um, it was um, varnished entirely by, by Montagnana, but the scroll, in fact, is by Peter Guarneri of Venice, uh, absolutely certified that it is that. And the varnish is Montagnana. So it must have been, one can only imagine one of those amazing moments where uh, maybe Montagnana was running out of time or, or he'd broken the scroll he made for, and he needed something, so he went to the, to the other workshop and picked up a scroll. Uh, so it is uh, uh, a very nice mixture of those two great masters. Um, and uh, for me, it's a particularly wonderful thing to play because the, the last professional owner was one of my dearest friends and really my mentor, I would say, uh, Keith Harvey, mm -hmm. who, who um, he in fact was also a student of Douglas Cameron, who actually owned the cello before that. So when I was at the academy, I had some lessons with, with Douglas Cameron when Derek Simpson was away on tour with the quartet. Um, and then Keith, uh, who I've known since I'm about 13 years old and who I used to visit regularly, and he, he although he was never my teacher, um, inspired me enormously opened my ears to players from the past. In fact, it was thanks to him that I went to study with Piotr Gorski because uh, Keith Harvey went for a short time to study with Piotr Gorski. And when he came back, he said to me, you absolutely do whatever you can to get to, to meet uh, Gregor Piotr Gorski, which I did. Um, I never thought I would be playing on this cello, which I heard so many times in Keith's hands. Um, in the, especially in the Gabrielli Quartet when, when he was playing. Um, and uh, just serendipity, lots of events made it ha happen that I can, I now have the use of it, which is wonderful. And uh, so for me, playing the cello is not, it's not only that it's a, a wonderful instrument, uh, a very reliable instrument too, but also every time I take it out of the case, I feel I have contact with uh, with particularly with Keith, who was such a dear friend, and with Douglas Cameron, who was, in a way, both our teachers. So, so it's a special, ex another experience. Um, notwithstanding, um, it is a cello with with big projection, uh, enormous um, colour, uh, a, a sort of density of sound, uh, which is very special. Um, it's almost sometimes I feel it's like a sort of soup. You know, it's yes. it's nothing. It's not thin. It's it's mm. rich and and dark, um, and uh, it is surprisingly stable in all weathers. It, it's a very very uh, healthy. It's actually um, Robin Aitchison recently made a wonderful copy of this, and he told me that the measurements. He said it's amazing amount of wood in the table. It's more than often. Not to its detriment at all, but it is a, you know, beefy instrument. 
One of the things that is, is really extraordinary to me that this particular cello in the room as we sit in front of it was known to Beethoven and to Haydn because Romberg played chamber music for Beethoven and Beethoven was a great admirer of Romberg's. And to me, it's just extraordinary to think this, this cello, which played some of the first performances of the late mm -hmm. Beethoven string quartets, here it is yeah. in the front room in South East London. That's the story of these, of these great instruments. And yeah. of course, uh, it was uh, Beethoven admiring Romberg and saying, I would like to write you a concerto. And Romberg said, don't worry, I've already written my own, which is one of the worst things that ever happened to us cellists. But um, you've just recorded all the Romberg. No, 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 not all. My not goodness, all. Yeah. that that would need. Uh, I'd have to have started much earlier, but um, I did record uh, three and um, with the London Mozart players, which will eventually come out on CPO, I hope. Um, which was a very humbling experience because Romberg was a master cellist uh, uh, with an enormous hand, a left hand. He wrote very, very difficult things for, for us to play, but also from some wonderful touching, um, especially the slow movements are, are, are lovely. So it was great to play it on this cello. Um, it didn't play it for me at all. Um, as uh, so, some of my colleagues were saying, you know, the instrument doesn't do it. You have to, you have to do all of it. But I think it's the associations, the historic associations are inspiring. I mean, I, I've played on many, many, many new instruments. I love new instruments. I'm a great admirer of, of, of contemporary makers and I, I own several. Um, and I, um, I just love that adventure of not only uh, speaking to makers and, and what, what we're trying to achieve uh, and the pride with which one can play an instrument and people have no idea if it's a valuable old instrument or a modern instrument i mean that that to me is very very honest and good um and so i i also have been through all of that learned a lot by playing on on new instruments and continue to even though i have the use of this yeah. one thing i must ask you you studied in the united states with piatigorsky but I know you played chamber music with Heifetz and Piatigorsky. Tell me, what was that like? Yes, I, I mean, all of us who were in the class, uh, I believe Geoffrey is, is watching at the moment, Geoffrey Solo, I'd say hi. I'm glad that you've recovered well from your recent uh, surgery. Um, but all of us had the opportunity to, to play chamber music with Heifetz at the time. And... Um, uh, I did have an amazing chance to play with both of them uh, one evening. Um, I remember uh, it was a party at uh, at Heifetz's house and uh, we played the Dvorak string sextet, uh, two cellos. And um, I, the first thing that I did, I was terribly nervous, of course. It was just, it was only uh, guests there. It wasn't public as such, but I was nervous. Because there's no rehearsal, you just play. You're supposed to just be able to know the piece. I mean, yeah. I've never even heard the piece before. But first thing happened that I uh, put my end pin uh, into a kind of mat that Heifetz had put on the floor because he had parquet floor everywhere. He had a thing about parquet. So I put the pin in, uh, and the first thing that happened, the first note, it's, I slipped like that, and there was a, a standard lamp in the middle of the group, which went just aiming for Heifetz and his <laughs> wonderful violin. And um, I, I, I remember very little about the music making, but I remember the absolute horror of seeing this happening. And, and Heifetz caught the lamp, and the violin was like this, and Piatigorsky took off his belt and improvised something for my end pin. And, uh, well, the rest of it was just a kind of fuzz of... I don't know. I was, it was how, amazing. How amazing. Yeah, but of course I, I do remember more and I did have other opportunities. Uh, it was a totally extraordinary experience uh, and um, I, I was very, very, very lucky. Well, I think we should hear you playing this 
this terrific cello. Now you're going to play Chanson de Matin by Sir Edward Elgar and an arrangement for cello and strings by composer Donald Fraser. The conductor is Kenneth Woods. In conclusion, I must express many thanks to the cellists who have so generously given their time to talk about their cellos and their cello playing, and a big thank you to all those who gave permission for video and images to be used. Thank you to our partners Cello Bello and Edgar Ross and Mina Mazzolari for sending their wonderful cello to be played. Thank you to Selma Gotchen, the chairman of the London Cello Society, and Innes Day for their encouragement and support. Most especially, we must thank the directors, my luthier, Co for their fine contemporary instruments and Pedro and uh, Pedro Silva and Ari Lang just to say them without their active assistance this event would not have been possible thank you before we move on to any questions you might send with Raphael I'll tell you that London Shelter Society is an educational charity that can only exist through the support of its members or by donation if you have enjoyed today's event then please find out more of the Society's work at londoncellos.org. The Society does not only organises events for cello enthusiasts of all ages, but also discreetly raises funds and oversees educational projects for those young musicians who otherwise would not have access to cello lessons or instruments. To share our joy and fulfilment we receive from music, and the cello especially, is to offer life-changing experiences to young musicians. Thank you for watching. We've very much enjoyed presenting these cellos. Hope to see you on a future presentation. 
Thank you, Raphael, so much for joining me. My greatest Great. pleasure. Thank you.